Okay. Welcome to Live Living Transformational Living Magazine. Hi, I'm Edda Dale Hornsteiner, and today we have with us a special guest, and his name is Dr. William Struthers. Dr. Struthers is the author of Wired for Intimacy, How Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain. He is also a neuroscientist, a researcher, and a professor at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Welcome, Bill. Anna, thanks so much for having me. It's good to finally get connected with you. Yes, it is so good. Now, I know we'll be discussing your book, Wired for Intimacy, How Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain. But I must say, <laughs> that book covers a whole span of different mm -hmm. topics that affects so many of us just as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so I want to be able to talk a little bit about other subject matters such as sexuality, our identity, but of course we'll be focusing on pornography still and its impact on men, especially within our context, Christian men. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now it says that pornography is powerful. In reading the intro to your book or description of your book, it says that for many cases, such as in prayer, um, accountability <coughs> groups, they have offered very limited help. Yeah. Now, why do you think that has been the case in treating this powerful addiction called pornography? Well, that's a, that's a really good question because it, for me, when I wrote the book, I had to kind of step back uh, and, and rather than looking at the pornography addiction as the problem, really what, it, what for me it was is I had to step back and see it as a symptom of a much deeper problem. And so what happened was, you know, there would be some, some students or some gentlemen who would find themselves kind of caught up in pornography. And the funny thing is, you know, as a neuroscientist, I'm actually studying rats. You know, I'm studying the, the, the sexual circuitry and, and chemicals and hormones and rats having sex. I wasn't really interested in humans, but, uh, but, but you know, people would come in and ask me about this because they heard I was a sex researcher. And so what, what happened was they would say, look, I'm, I'm praying, I'm reading my Bible, I've got a bunch of guys who are helping me out. Why, is, why am I still struggling with this? And so what I did is, as someone who trains clinical psychologists, I, I kind of had to step back and say, well, let's talk a little bit about why these things aren't working. And they're not working because, uh, for the most part, you're really not understanding what you're made for. So the mm. questions of identity and the questions of sort of embodiment and questions of, you know, dealing with the reality of, you know, how's a brain built and how does, you know, being a man influence the way that you see sexual images in a way that's different from women. That's really uh, what I found is that, you know, in many ways they were sort of banging their heads against a wall um, that was not going to get knocked down. So they had to come, rather than trying to go through the wall, they had to find a way to go around the wall. And that's what I wrote right. the book for. Before we go any further then, um, I want to establish clearly, and I think this is really important mm -hmm. in uh, the culture we're living in, and that is what is healthy yeah. Now, you, dif you I notice that you distinguish between these two words. What is healthy sexuality and what is healthy masculinity? Right. Let's clear that up cuz I think sure. that needs to be answered first of all so we know what the somewhat what the model is. Right. I think, you know, uh, many researchers will talk about the difference between sex and gender. And, and I think that's really important because sometimes people sort of make them the same thing. And, and sex, as, as a, once again, as a researcher for me, is about reproductive status. So, uh, you know, it, it, we're talking about your genetics, we're talking about your reproductive organs, we're talking about all that stuff. So there's, there's sex uh, and, and as reproductive status when contrasted with gender, you know, and, and that's where we use the language of masculine or feminine. We talk about, you know, football's a masculine game. Well, football might be a masculine game, but that doesn't mean that you are better at reproduction, right? It, it's a different issue entirely. So gender and masculine, the language of masculinity and femininity is oftentimes tied to the way that culture makes sense of our differences between males and females. So I think that, you know, I'm very comfortable talking about sexuality, and then when we do move into the language about masculinity, well, now we have to kind of, you know, stop and say, well, 
are these things exclusively male? That is, are they do they only apply to male, or do they only apply to female? You know, is uh, you know a person who is good at math does that make them masculine, or a person who is competitive does that make them masculine? There's a lot of women that I know. They're a lot more uh, competitive than I am. My wife being one of them, uh, and who are probably a lot better at uh, some some you know math and some visual spatial skills. And there's some women who would look at me and say, well, you know, emotionally connecting and verbal skills. You know, uh, Bill might be a little better at those things than I am as a, as a woman. So, so thinking about the way we use masculine or feminine, we got to be very careful about that. So, I tend to talk more uh, about sexuality and thinking about, you know, what are, you know, what are, what are, what does it mean to be a healthy sexual person? And that's where you get into things like understanding how your maleness or your femaleness influences. You know your identity. You know you sort of the way that you understand yourself as a human being. Our sexuality is loaded with a moral dimension. Like you know, what is what's the right way for this conversation? For example, as a, as as a man and a woman, for us to talk about sexuality, what's a a healthy, honoring way for us to do that with one another? Um, you know, how does the, the the fact that I've been raised as a man in this particular culture influence the way that I even talk about uh, you know masculine as sort of uh, you know, aggression, or well, is that aggression to conquer something that conquer someone or something, or is that aggression as a response to defend? And so, so when we do get into the the discussion about you know what does it mean to be masculine, um, for for me a lot of, being masculine just means it's colored by being male, um, and the the label of masculine just sort of gets put on top of it because we kind of like to use those labels to help us make sense of the world, and that's helpful, but sometimes it gets in the way. So, okay, so what is healthy sexuality and masculinity? Okay, the reason I'm asking that I want to emphasize this question here, um, I think in particularly in church, mm -hmm. how um, um, do male and female interact in church, mm -hmm. especially because I think sometimes I see the awkwardness in church. How is a young man supposed to interact with a young woman, a young Christian woman, and vice versa? Because I had this, and I remember I had this interesting experience when I was living in Virginia. Mm -hmm. My pastor had to address the men in the church and how they were to treat the young women. Mm -hmm. So, so I think there's a need for for us, even you know, within the church or within our Christian. Um, Context to define how does that what does that look like what is it to 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 be have a healthy sexuality and masculinity as we interact with each other? Well, I think you know uh, the the first thing is to to step back and to kind of you know as as Christians what we want to do is we want to think about ourselves as you know not just having our own souls saved from hell but actually being a part of God's family. So all conversation about you know as men and women how we are to interact with each other has to be first sort of couched within the language of family. You know, we we are parts of of God's family. And when you look at scripture too that's what it does is you know uh, you know, young men, you should treat your sisters in this way. You know, young women, you should treat your brothers in this way. And so, talking, you know, what do, what do brothers and sisters do? You know, I mean, they you know the brothers defend their sisters. They try to empower their sisters. They honor them. And you know, what do the sisters do? Well, they defend their brothers and they you know honor their brothers. And so, there may be a particular flavor in the way that they do it. They may do it more relationally or more physically. So when we talk about, you know, in the church, you know, what is a masculine, you know, uh, uh, you know man supposed to do? Well, um, I think sometimes we get really caught up in, you know, I, sometimes I, I think in the book I talk about the Rambo Jesus. You know, like <laughs> all Christian men aren't supposed to be these big, buff, you know, kind of violent, um, you know, angry, you know, men. There's, there's a place for men to be, to be quiet and to be soft and to be thoughtful uh, in the way that they deal with other people. So kind of tr creating too narrow of a definition of masculinity, I'm always really cautious about that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to say that men are the competitors, they're the drivers, they're the leaders. And Because sometimes, you know, there's, uh, there, there's times when my wife is the one that I want leading the charge because she <laughs> has the gifts and the talents for that and she has the passion for that. And my job is to enable her and to get into line behind her. And, there's, and there may be some men in some Christian traditions that say, oh, no, 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 you can't ever do that. The man should always be the leader. And I think what that does is it sort of, uh, you know, kind of, 
paints a picture of what the Christian man should look like that is far too small of a box. And so I like using, you know, th there's a masculine way for you to defend, and that's colored by the fact that you're a man. So what makes it masculine? Your maleness makes it masculine. There's a feminine way to defend and to be, you know, outspoken. What makes it feminine? The fact that you're a female. So I think we get caught up in these categories where we want, you know, only women to be nurturing. You know what? Um, if my dad didn't nurture me, I wouldn't be the man that I am today. You know, uh, you know, and, and it's not just that it's felt exclusively to my mom. But for me, it gets to the, the deeper questions of, you know, what is love? You know, love protects and love nurtures. And there's a male way sometimes that men will find that they more easily uh, protect and nurture. And there's a female way that many women will find that they will protect and nurture. But just because you find yourself nurturing in a way that perhaps you know, looks more like what the other sex, the opposite sex or the other gender looks like, doesn't make you any less male or make you any less female. Or, you know, it does, just because I love nurturing my daughters doesn't make me less masculine. In some ways, it makes me more masculine that I nurture my daughters. But I nurture them in a subtly different way than I nurture my sons. Uh, you know, I've, I've got a son who's, uh, who's in, in sixth grade, and I do interact with him in a different way because we're guys, and we, we share similar body parts in some ways. And there's kind of a connection there that I'll never be able to share with my daughters. But the fact that I'm different uh, from my daughters in body means that I love them in a subtly different way because I don't understand them all the time. And so I need to kind of give them grace in a way because – they're different from me. So, you know, the, the language of masculinity, what I don't like are the boxes. When the church says, this is the box that the men have to fit in, this is the box that the women have to fit in, the bigger box should be, what does it mean to love well? What does it mean to honor one another well? What does it mean to, you know, empower one another when we find ourselves in bondage? And I think that's the problem that we have in the church is we've created these boxes that people don't fit in, and, and sometimes they feel ashamed that they don't fit in those things. Mm -hmm. Well, let's zone in now to your book. Okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. let me just remind our listening audience, it's called Wired for Intimacy, How the how Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain. Right. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between a male and a female brain? According well, to you? Yeah, okay. that's a great question, and people always want to know about that because, well, once again, getting back to that language of sex as reproductive status, you know, we think about male and female, and when a baby's born, they kind of look between the baby's legs, and for the better part of humans, human history, they said, oh, that's a boy or, oh, that's a girl. And so when we, we hear the male brain, oftentimes we will want to say, well, you know, is there like a, you know, like a, a male brain that's kind of like structurally different then like a female brain is structurally different in the same way that like their their reproductive organs are. And 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 so people, you know, if I don't I don't mean to be crass, but I'm just clinical. Like it's not like there is, you know, a, a penis brain. You know, it's not like a male brain doesn't look like physically different. There's so many different subregions in the brain. And what you find is that some parts of the brain will be sort of wired up because of the testosterone in such a way that there is like a really masculine style or structure or set of connections. And there are other parts in the, for example, in the female brain that are really wired up as female. And so you've got like maybe, you know, 10,000 different subregions in the brain. And rather than being like a male brain and a female brain, it's the language that I use in the book is that there's a mosaic that there's like all these different tiles, like a mosaic has, you know, hundreds of different tiles, right? And some mm -hmm. tiles have subtly different colors. And if you think of, you know, male as a black color uh, and female as a white color, well, some of those tiles are really, really black or really, really white, depending on the hormones that you have. But some of these tiles are also trained. I mean, the brain's a plastic organ. So you can be encouraged into something that is, uh, you know, we'll say, uh, you know, uh, for example, if I'm a male and, um, and people say, oh, no, we really want you to be much more empathetic. And so I, and so I exercise the emotional parts of my brain in a way um, that's, you know, we might say, well, normally that's more of a female part of your brain. It's akin to like bleaching some of those tiles so they end up looking a little more white. Or if a young girl is really encouraged to be, you know, competitive, well, in some ways that sort of, you know, bleach, not bleaching it, but sort of dying and darkening it to make it look a little more, you know, black or, or, or so it becomes a, a different shade of gray and I hate to use the phrase you know, 50 shades mm -hmm. of gray because of you know the, uh, the, the <laughs> out there now but in some ways you know the, the brain is like has all these tiles 
And some of them can be really masculine, some of them can be really feminine, and some of them will be influenced by kind of the, the experience that you have. So what you can end up with is some, in, some people who will have both masculine and feminine characteristics. But what's really interesting, I think, with, with respect to the book is that I really wanted to focus in on the parts of the brain that are involved in picking up sexual cues. And what you see in men is that a lot of those dark tiles, like those black dark tiles um, that are influenced by testosterone and encouraged in our culture, you know, it's okay for boys to look at porn, but for a girl to look at porn, oh my goodness, there must be something really, really wrong with her. Well, you know, for men, they have the cultural permission to look at this, or sometimes I'd argue even the expectation that they will look at it. Um, they've got these parts of their brain that really get kind of hyperactive when they see sexualized images, too. So, so for me, the, the male brain that I was thinking about is those parts of the brain that are very much wired to look at visual sexual cues, and, uh, and so that's where, uh, that's where the book kind of came out of. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, okay. So, so that's what makes like males and female brains different from one another. Right. It's not just not just the, the the stuff that's related to sex and sexual arousal and excitement and mating, but everything. You know, the styles of thinking, styles of talking, uh, you know, ways that we engage the environment. I mean, you know, men and women feel pain in subtly different ways. We mm -hmm. we perceive the world in different ways. And so, because of the sexual mosaic brain, we've got the complexity of of, of how sexual uh, you know, wiring can influence every aspect of what we do, but when it comes to sexual arousal and, you know, finding mates and, and the way that most people think about sex as like a genital thing, you know, males just kind of, they have some of these hardwired brain regions, and so porn just kind of is, a, is an easy hook to, uh, to get them kind of on the path to addiction mm -hmm. or at least on to some really maladaptive ways of thinking about sex, and what happens is it spills over into some of these other non-sexual parts of their life, you know, the way that they emotionally experience, uh, you know, just normal interactions. Uh, you know, a normal, com what should be just a normal conversation between a man and a woman, well, because he's polluted his mind with all of this pornography, he sexualizes her, and he becomes more preoccupied with whether or not she's attractive or she finds her arousing or not. And, and so I think that's one of the major problems that we find is that pornography really is not just about influencing sexual arousal, but it spills into all these other areas of your mind. Mm, what, so it affects all these different, um, I call them zones, so that yeah. we all have, it affects all those different areas. Sure. And so is that the reason it's, it's such a powerful addiction? Well, I think the reason that it's a powerful addiction is, you know, and, and I, we should even kind of step back and say, let's let's talk about this language of addiction, right? I mean, when okay. we, we use the language of addiction, we usually are talking about things like heroin or cocaine or methamphetamine or whatever. And, you know, as a brain scientist, what I know is the only reason why any of those drugs have any addictive properties at all is because they act on the brain's natural pleasure circuit. Well, what's the pleasure circuit there for? The pleasure circuit there is for so that when you're hungry and you eat something, it tastes good. When you're thirsty and you drink something, it tastes, you know, it, it, it feels good. And when you are sexual, and once again, not just in the genital sense, not just in that you're trying to have sex, but sex at its core is a relational drive. And when you're interacting with people in a, in, in a good way, whether that be your brother or your sister or your mom or your dad or your kids or a friend or whoever, that relational drive feels really, really good. Mm -hmm. And there's one sort of one sliver of that drive that is reserved for sort of the, the making of a life right, between a, a husband and a wife and the potential of this particular type of act can make a baby. And so when you, when you, when, when you have a husband and a wife engage in that behavior, it really bonds them. To, there's a great pleasure that's experienced there. And what it does is it bonds them together. And I'd argue it bonds them together uh, both for their own benefit because I think when you're bound to your spouse, you sort of reveal God in a way that you don't by yourself. Um, so that marriage 
can reveal God's image, but also when the husband and wife are bound together, that's good for the child. If a child happens to come about because of this act, you know, every you know every child it's in the ideal world will have a mom and a dad who love each other faithfully and monogamously, and that really is in the child's best interest as well. So you've got you know the kind of the, the broad range, and I'll kind of do, try to do this as best I can. You got this broad range of relational needs. And you've got this narrow, narrow sliver of it that is meant for just one specific type of relationship. But everything else, you know, whether that be brotherly or sisterly affection or, uh, you know, affection with your friends, or, uh, that's also kind of a, a relational need as well. So this one narrow sliver produces such great pleasure for the purpose of binding, uh, you know, parents together for the benefit of their child and also for their own benefit. Wow. It, that's already built into the system. So drugs like heroin, they get into the system, and because of their chemical structure and the way the system is designed, they exploit it and they hijack the system, which is why people will just become addicts. So you know the, the fact that people can become sex addicts or porn addicts or whatever kind of language that you want to use shouldn't be surprising because that's what the system is for. It's for wow. you know, sexual wow. intimacy. So, so with a child, with with a child in particular, you know, a child stumbles upon pornography because a lot of times that's where it begins. You know, a child stumbles on pornography, so that that hook in the brain—that's all it takes. You think a child would be addicted, to, addicted to um, pornography? Well, to a lot adulthood. Of it, yeah, a lot of it depends on when the child is exposed to it and how they make sense of it. So for a child who is exposed to pornography and uh, you know let's say you know a child like four or five years old they're gonna look at it and they're not gonna know what it is they're gonna say why these people don't have any clothes on whereas someone who's 10 or 11 or 12 and going through puberty the parts of their brain that are sort of like the radar that are now looking for these kinds of signals well it's gonna act on a system that's not mature so they're gonna they're going to be aroused by it, but they're not going to know what sense to make of it. And if that child gets instruction by a mom or a dad or, or someone you know who can say, look, it's okay for you to kind of notice this and become aroused by this, but this is what it's for, and, and to not shame them, but to help them understand what it's for, that child's going to be okay. It's the child that sort of doesn't get any instruction, that sort of just sort of flies around and eventually is going to stumble onto, uh, you know, sort of self-stimulation or masturbation or something like that. That child is going to feel shame. They're going to then kind of start walking down that aisle towards uh, towards becoming an addict because they haven't been gonna, given proper instruction about what their sexuality is. Right. All right. Now, what what's your comments on couples? Who use pornography yeah. to spice up their relationship? That's a that's a great comment, and I think this gets to a, a way that I think many Christians should think about that sexual relationship that is between a husband and a wife. You know, that's a sacred space, and if something is sacred, it's set apart for no one else. And so, as a uh, let's say, you know, as a, as a as a man who's married to to a woman, the last thing I want to do is invite someone else's sexuality into that bedroom. And so, you know, what? because essentially what happens is if you get, you know, a husband and wife may say, well, we're looking for something to spice up our relationship, um, to say, well, let's kind of have some other people show you how to do it. You know, as a man and a woman, you know, now watching pornography, basically what we're doing now is we're training ourselves to need someone else to get us aroused. We're needing someone else to instruct us rather than for us to discover it on our own and to me to be just only exclusively aroused by my wife or my wife to exclusively be aroused by me. As a man watching pornography uh, you know, with my wife, I wouldn't be paying attention to my wife. I'd be paying attention to the woman on the screen, which is so not a high want in a relationship. So, you know, people will use that argument, and I think when you really have a right understanding about that sexual relationship as a sacred thing, then it's like, well, why would you do that? That's like inviting someone else into your bedroom. It's just you're not doing the person. You're just inviting the image of the person. 
So to me, that's a that's an argument that doesn't really hold much water. That, you know, we need something to spice up our sex life. Well, perhaps what you need to spice up your sex life is actually to, you know, actually be talking more to each other and asking each other more questions and uh, and exploring that rather than watching other people have sex. Right, right. I I, I was saying when you were speaking, thinking, wow, it, is, it sounds like you're hijacking your relationship. Oh, yeah. You're, well, you're poisoning the relationship. What you're doing is, is, is essentially what you're saying to your spouse. If you're saying that you need porn to spice up your sex life, is you're saying to your spouse, you are not sufficient for me. I need mm. something more than you can offer in order to become aroused anymore. And, and, and I think that undercuts the trust in the relationship and it undercuts the strength of the relationship to say you're not sufficient. And so now, you know, what's to say then that, you know, well, I need another partner, that you're not a sufficient partner for me. The point of, you know, you becoming one in, in a marital relationship is that you are finding more and more of your needs met in that person, especially when it comes to your sexuality. So porn just is counterintuitive to that. It's a, it's a poison to that kind of uh, kind of uh, relational development. Hmm. Okay. I want to read a quote from your book. Okay. It says, fathers teach the skills necessary to flourish in a challenging world. Mm -hmm. One of the most important tools is <coughs> emotional mastery. Right. Mm -hmm. However, emotional mastery often masquerades as emotional repression or emotional inability. There should be little surprise at the result. As men grow up without these tools, their sexual drives and emotions become fueled by pornography. Yeah. Regularly fueled sexual tension and emotion by pornography results in patterns or acting out that can be traumatic and disastrous. Mm -hmm. When men do not learn to deal with their emotions in a healthy way, are you saying it can lead to such maladaptive behaviors such as pornography? Well, certainly. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when you think about the, the emotional rush that comes when a person is sexually aroused, uh, do not have to be given, uh, given license. You know, so if you're walking down the street and you find yourself aroused, your body's going to respond to that. You need to learn how to understand that emotion and bring it under control. So whether that anger is another, uh, for example, mm -hmm. anger is a real common thing that men will get angry at their spouses and they can't control their anger. So what they'll do is they'll know that by by viewing pornography that they can actually hurt their spouse by doing this. That's how they uh, they kind of deal with their anger is they go and they view the pornography and they act out to it and uh, now their anger's calm and they can deal with it. Nah, you know, too bad that hurts my wife. I don't care. So it becomes a subtle form of aggression. Now, on the other side of it, what you get is if a person feel if a man feels like he can't express himself emotionally, he sort of is more like a stuffer, right? He stuffs his emotions down. Well, that's a, a different type of emotional mastery, uh, which is where you're trying to just kill your emotions entirely. The issue is not how do I get rid of my emotions, but how do I channel my emotions in ways that are healthy and productive. Anger is not a bad emotion if you're anger at injustice in the world. Anger is a bad emotion when you're now slinging you know, your, uh, your words or you're slinging your fists or you're relationally doing something out of anger and you're hurting other people. Anger can be a good emotion. You just have to understand what is the source of the anger and now appropriately find a way to respond to it in such a way that actually blesses rather than curses. Um, you know, a, a sexual arousal is an emotion that if you try to kill it, um, it's, it's not going to go away. And, and so what you're going to find is that you're going to look for a way to get rid of it in a way that may actually be more unhealthy. You know, you start looking at pornography and, and masturbating to it. That's an unhealthy way to respond to your sexual arousal. And what you're doing is you're actually now training yourself uh, into this particular type of ritual pattern, and so you become a slave to the emotion rather than mastering the emotion. So that's what I was getting at in that section on emotional mastery. You know, sexual arousal, anger, all you know, sadness, um, excitement, you know, all of the different, you know, disgust, all the emotions that we experience. The goal is not to get rid of them. The goal is to understand how to interpret them and then find a response 
that actually blesses rather than curses, that encourages us to become more godly, uh, you know, more virtuous, rather than, you know, someone who is actually more depraved or someone who cultivates vice. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that, that's a very good point. And as you were speaking, I was thinking, um, when I studied mm -hmm. or did my thesis on, in theater, one of the things that I found out really is that schools don't really teach students how to um, deal with their emotions. You know, we teach them math, we teach them English, we teach them chart, but in terms of emotional intelligence, at least, there's very little taught on how do you handle emotions, how do you deal with them, how do you rechannel them. I mean, when I did drama, I did theater, it was a it was a very good vehicle, a medium to do that. Um, how does the church teach mm -hmm. it? Um, some people believe that everything should be some spiritual, not emotional, yeah. not on the soulish level. So where is the balance here? Yeah, well, here is where I think that, you know, you once again, you get to the reality that men and women have different brains, and we experience emotions in different ways. And so what you really need are the emotionally mature men, that is the men who know how to govern their emotions, need to come alongside the younger men when they're walking during the season of you know, childhood and adolescence and young adulthood to say, okay, yeah, you're angry. You know what? It's okay to be angry about you know, X, Y, and Z, about these things. Here is what you do. You stop before you act. You take a breath. You understand what's going on behind this. We talk about it. You come, you know, you come to me. Here's some, you know, physical things that I can give you. Uh, you know, I mean, some people will talk about, you know, punching pillows. I'm not a real big fan of, you know, catharsis and, you know, kind mm -hmm. of, you know, getting pillows and hitting people. I'm not a big fan of that because all that think that that does is that teaches you to to strike out. But you know, I I think that the young men in the church need to look at the older men and say. Who are the spiritually mature, the emotionally mature men? And we go to them. And I think the older men as well, we need to step back and say, how do we teach the young men to acknowledge their emotions and train them and give them opportunities to exercise, skills to get these emotions under control? And how do we show them grace when they fail? Because, you know, we I failed a lot of times when I was a kid. You know, I, I didn't regulate. It's not like I was born regulating my emotions well. So it's, it's a lifelong skill that you have to be maturing in and cultivating in. And so within the church, you know, I mean, honestly, a lot of what we do in the church is very segmented. It's very much, you know, we, okay, there's, you know, 60 kids in a, uh, in a youth group, and we've got one youth pastor who's in his 20s and, you know, a couple of volunteers who are in their, uh, you know, their, uh, their 30s. And, and, you know, where are the older men who are coming in and, and pulling these young boys aside and saying, Let's talk about this and honoring the younger generation. Uh, I, I think we're very uh, segmented and stratified in the way that we do our ministry, especially our youth ministry. And, and as you mentioned earlier, in schools, our schools are by definition stratified by age range. You know, it, it's it's a teacher, you know, who's normally, you know, is one representative. And depending on the quality of that teacher, how in the world are they going to be able to train you know, 50, you know, 10 to 15 boys who happen to be in their class, um, uh, if they're a woman, you know, that, that, that a woman who's, you know, got a you know, classroom of fourth grade boys, she doesn't know what it's like to, to be a boy developing. So, you know, I think having more men in the educational system, I think, is, is really important. Having uh, men from a variety of different seasons of life as well. And, and for, for the men to really step up to the plate and say, we need to look at ourselves. Are we emotionally mature? Because we have a lot of older men who are, you know, emotionally still adolescents you know, who are not mature and who have actually, you know, who are just in adulthood and they're cultivating poor emotional habits and they, you know, they're, they're slingers, you know, they sling their emotions when they get angry or they stuff things and they stuff things and then there's this volcanic eruption that explodes. But how do we, you know, get, you know, get the men who are mature to help those other men, by the way, right, those older men, to, to teach them how to become more mature. Because you've really got this neurological window where you're trying to cultivate emotional regulation. Because for some guys, that explosion that happens, pornography is the thing that fuels it. And the stuffing that goes on with the emotions is the thing that pushes them towards pornography. Or the, the slinging that they do is uh, you know chasing out at the pornography and the emptiness and the lack of 
real satisfaction uh, emotionally that they get when they're doing all of the slinging, uh, that emptiness is the thing that pushes them back to the pornography. So I think emotional regulation is really the key for men who are struggling with pornography because it's not always just sexual perversion or drive that's pushing them towards pornography. Oftentimes there are emotional drives that are pushing them that they don't even really understand as the key source or the key trigger for why they are looking at pornography. Wow. That's that's really profound um, in what you just said because we seldom, you know, our culture seldomly addresses the emotional aspect in terms of men. I mean, like you said, women, we women are considered more emotional and it's okay for us to express our emotions or to be emotional, but it's somewhat not okay for men to do so. And so, yeah, that's, and so that's yeah. interesting. Well, and, and just to kind of give another example, I mean, you know, there, for a long time, the belief was that women suffered from depression more than men did because, well, women were just more emotional and perhaps more prone to that. Uh, but what, what you actually see is that men are, you know, very close to, you know, struggling with depression in the same ways that women do. Men just don't feel the freedom or show the initiative to seek help for it. And so what happens is you're actually look, seeing that women are much more likely to seek help for their depression than men are. And, as, and, and that's why people thought that you know, women were, you know, had depression more than men did. Men were also more likely to use alcohol or substance, other substances to self-medicate their depression. Um, and so, so really you know, when you talk about emotional needs, in many ways men have – Emotional needs just like women do, but if the culture, you know, it's not manly to go to see a therapist. Why would you want to do that? Um, you know, well, you know, what do men do? We just, we just go get drunk. That's how we deal with things. And so the culture will dictate, you know, how men seek out help, how they'll medicate. And so when you look back at the data, it's like, oh, I guess women are more emotional. No, men have emotional needs just like women do. They just don't know how to handle them very well sometimes. Mm -hmm. Well, how does a, a, a male brain, um, how can a male brain that's been hijacked be rewired? Yeah, that's a great question. In, in some ways, you want to take advantage of the fact that the brain is this plastic organ anyway. I mean, the, this, it's kind of a two-edged sword. You know, the, the, the rules that govern how you became, uh, you know, hijacked and addicted are also the rules that will dictate how you recover. So you've got this plasticity, but a lot of it is, you know, involved in training up your mind in a way to identify your triggers, to find out, you know, what the deeper emotional needs are, because, you know, the research seems to suggest that men are going to pornography for these other deeper relational and emotional needs that aren't being met. And so what they're, it's kind of like, you know, when you're hungry and you eat junk food, you know, you don't, your body is hungry and it needs all of these things. And if you feed it junk food, well, that doesn't really satisfy your needs, so you're going to want to eat even more. You're going to be more hungry. And so if you keep eating junk food, what's going to happen is you're going to get more and more unhealthy, and your needs really aren't going to be met. So part of it is, for, is understanding your spiritual, your emotional needs. How, what are they, number one? And are, is there a better way to feed yourself rather than on the, the, the pornography, which is like the junk food of intimacy? Right. So what are the healthy ways uh, that you can feed yourself? And oftentimes, you know, what we find is a lot, of, uh, a lot of men really have unhealthy relationships with their fathers, a lot of unresolved issues. And when those get resolved, you know, the need for porn kind of decreases. A lot of them have some issues with their mothers that they have to resolve. And when that gets resolved, you know, a lot of them don't know how to think about women as anything other than sex objects. And so when you give them those tools – they have the ability now to start strengthening other parts of their mind so that when the porn comes, it's kind of, I like to use the example of muscles, right? If you exercise one muscle, like if I exercise my right arm, right, and I'm lifting weights with my right arm over and over again, my left arm will, will get weak because it's not getting used, and my right arm will get stronger. So what you have to do is teach them how to use these other relational muscles so that those can become the preferred muscles. Those can become the preferred way. So there's an educational component to it. They have to learn how to think. They've got to learn to deal with some of these deeper issues. And when those get dealt with, that relational need is met in a much more healthy way. And so porn becomes less attractive. You know, M&Ms don't taste as good when you're a person who's eating a healthy diet. Mm. <laughs> you got a point there. 
Okay. Well, but, but in, in the same way, if I could also say, if all you're doing is eating M and M's, apples don't taste very good. And right. but the apple is going to satisfy you in a way that the M and M's won't. So, and I, I apologize to the Hershey people. You know that I hope <laughs> they don't take the best of my use of M and M's. But but you know, think about it, you know M and M's. You know they all look the same. And you don't see M&Ms in nature, right? You don't see those kind of bright, shiny colors, and they're packaged. And porn's packaged. It's not real. You don't see people like that in nature, these people with augmented body parts, and they've had all this surgery, and they've been airbrushed, and they've been, you know, got all this makeup on and all this kind of stuff. That's not real. And so when you're eating, when you're consuming that, it's really warping your idea. And Andrea Dworkin has a, has, has a great quote. Uh, she says, you know, when men are consuming pornography all, all over and over again, real naked women are just bad porn. And so when you've lost the ability for a real human being to sort of, you know, to see the vulnerability and the beauty in that, that's a sign that you've eaten way too much junk food that you can't appreciate the real thing. Right, right. And so just to <clears throat> reiterate, um, so education is a, an important part of solving this problem. Sure, right. And, and then I'd say, you know, and once you're educated, you know, certainly uh, identifying the triggers is the other. So thinking rightly about sexuality is the first step. Um, I think the second step is uh, thinking uh, also about you know, getting some of those deeper unresolved issues and what are the triggers uh, you know that are happening. So identifying what the triggers are is the second step. And once you've identified the triggers, you have to have a response. You know, that is, you have to find some way of sort of fighting back when you feel the need, when the red flag goes off, or you know, oh man, there's a trigger. I now this was the thing that would start me off on my ritual. You know, experimenting and developing ways of counteracting that need a healthier way of making that connection. Uh, you know, for some people that might be journaling, for some people it might be listening to praise music, for other people it might be, uh, you know, kind of doing any number of things. You know, but, but people don't realize some of the world's best sonnets were written when a man or a woman felt a, a need to connect with someone. Some of the world's best music was written because of a, of a longing, you know, an unrequited longing uh, between two people. So finding, you know, a healthy way, uh, you know, an outlet that once again blesses rather than curses mm -hmm. has to be, you know, unique for each person. There's no one silver bullet that works for everybody. There's no one technique that works with, with any one person. But, you know, Finding people who know you, finding older men, especially for guys, who can say, "Let's try this," you know, "Let's let's see how this goes," and so you know, call me or let's you know, let's get together. And and you know, a lot of times, what I'll do is when guys feel like they're having, you know, they feel like their triggers have been uh, kind of gone off, they'll call me and and you know, we'll go out for wings. You know, we we go to a <laughs> restaurant, we sit and we talk, and 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 I don't shame them, and I say, "Look, you, there's nothing wrong with you recognizing that you were in temptation." And, and calling a one to talk to someone, and so so I'll so I'll sacrifice and I'll go out. And my wife's pretty good about letting me go out as long as I'm not eating you know wings you know four or five times a day uh, you know seven days a week. Um, but you know I have that freedom to go and just be a friend for them and to help them process. And and they'll say yeah you know I think I'm in a you know by the end of the wings getting eaten you know they'll say yeah I'm in a better place. I I, I don't need to do that. I just needed that. So for some guys, they just need that connection point. They need an older man to bless them, or they need to. And then I'll say, well, you know, let's time, let's try this. You know, let's, you know, you're a really musical guy. You know, you know, let's find some songs for you to, uh, you know, do you want to compose something, or let's let's use this as a way for you to, you know, write a song about the temptation. How about that? So, so, so men getting together with other men who will encourage them to find other healthy ways to deal with the, the temptation, that's the next thing on the agenda. Because what works for you know, one guy maybe won't work for another guy. So one size fits all generic way of dealing with temptation doesn't honor the uniqueness of that man. So getting to know them and getting to, to kind of hear what there is and finding out what their needs are, that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Um, one last question. Sure. And all that we have talked about in terms of how our brain functions, mm -hmm. we have sexual arousal is natural for us oh, as yeah. human beings. Um, we we have all have triggers. Um, our brain functions a certain way. Some of us have more shades, like you said. Some of us have more colors here, mosaic, that analogy that you used. 
what does this all tell us about our Creator? What does it reveal about Him? I think it reveals that our Creator is a life giver. You know that that you know when you look at human sexuality, you know, giving life is not just about having babies. You can bless someone and they can enjoy life in abundance by uh, you know for for me you know I'm an older man uh, I can I can be a life-giving man in the way that I connect with younger men and younger women and men the same age and actually even men who are older than me um, you know I can't do that as a woman but you know trying to understand our sexuality as loaded with opportunities for relationships and as those relationships are good and they honor the boundaries that God has given us that is life in abundance so, uh, so, so you know, to step back and to say, you know, our sexuality is, you know, speaks to the life-giving diversity of our God. You know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There's diversity that's found in the Triune God, and there's a diversity that gives life. It does not take life. You know, we worship a God who is not a God of the dead. He is a God of the living. And so, for me, that's what I return to when I think about how our sexuality, uh, you know, what what it reveals about the God that we worship. Well, wow. and I, the key word I heard was relationships, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. and, you know that's what it seems to boil down to, mm -hmm. that if somehow even from I would say from childbirth, if those relationships are not healthy, it somewhat stunts us for the rest of our lives. We it, are, does. We are, it seems like we're we're always trying to find a way or a path to mm -hmm. developing that healthy relationship which which I think parallels or leads to also our relationship with God because we all know that if you've had an abusive father some people have trouble seeing God as a good father yeah. or one yes. you know what I mean so it definitely affects us so I see relationships is really almost like the key word here in all of this yeah, and I think that's where you know, I talk about this a little bit in my book in the section. You know, what does it mean? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? And the way theologians understand that, um, you know, many theologians will argue that you know God is a relational God, Father to Son, Father to Spirit, you know, Spirit to Son. You know, is the defining characteristic of the Triune Christian God that it is anchored in relationship. And so when we are made in the image of God, you know, the Triune God. You know, we image him because of the relationships that we're in. We're in the relationships with him, in relationships with one another. And so there is that relational component to being made in God's image that I think sometimes gets lost. Uh, and there's a sexual component to that as well. You know, that certainly, you know, male and female, you know, out of that relationship can come new life. But uh, but I think also between the family of God, between, you know, you know, mother and daughter, you know, father and daughter, mother, son, father, son, uh, you know, brothers and sisters, you know, cousins, you know, there's, there's a, that relationality has to be understood within the context of family and not just exclusively within the relationship between uh, husband and wife. Today we've been speaking with Dr. William Strathers, the author of Wired for Intimacy, How Pornography Hijacks the Male Brain and a professor of Wheaton College. Bill, thank you so much for joining us with this interview today. Thank you, Ed. It was a blessing. Mm -hmm.